Okay, so let's get started. Good afternoon. Um, so we're getting towards the end of, of the semester in terms of uh, material that we, we will cover. This will be the last topic, which is the facility location models. And today we're gonna go through some of the aspects of this problem. And then on our next lecture, we're gonna focus on solving, solving the problem. Um, today we're going to show some some ways of, of, of addressing the problem from different perspectives. So this is lecture 12, facility location models. So how location fits the operation management uh, philosophy? Also, from an industrial engineering perspective, how this uh, location or how to locate facilities fits our, our philosophy. Um, so we use operations to compete, operations that are competitive uh, weapon. Uh, we try to have efficient, optimal uh, operations management techniques. Um, and that's all part of our project, ma project management strategy. Um, in terms of managing processes, that's basically what we do as industrial engineers, um, manufacturing engineers might, might not focus a lot in, into the processes. But uh, we as industrial engineers, we, we look at the process strategy analysis, performance and quality, um, process layout, and also focus on making our systems lean, meaning that we, we try to cut as much waste as possible, waste in terms of uh, activities that are not adding any, any benefit to our final goal. Um, and then there's the aspect of, of the supply chain, which we address in this, in this course also uh, during the semester. So what is your supply chain strategy? And that's part of our location. Uh, so where are you gonna place your next facility? That type of decision or those type of decisions are uh, correlated to our supply chain. Uh, inventory management, uh, forecasting in terms of making those decisions, what are your expectations in terms of demand, also uh, in terms of your customers. Um, so all that connects with, with the value change, resource planning and, and scheduling. So in this lecture, we, we're gonna start with this, um, case, uh, this was in the 1980s uh, with BMW. Um, they, in the, in the late 80s, the fluctuating exchange rates and rising costs uh, convinced this company, BMW, that it was time to consider operating a new production facility outside the European borders. So if you're familiar with this uh, car company, they a, are a Germany, uh, company, start from Germany, but as most companies in the auto industry, they have expanded their, their business to have facilities in different countries. So that was their situation. Uh, in the 1980s, they said, okay, we, we are we're sending some of our product outside the European market. So maybe we should think about locating some of our business outside Europe. So a blank page approach was used to compile a list of 250 potential worthwhile sites. Analysis paired the list down to 10 options. A location in the United States was preferred due to its proximity to a large market segment for BMW other models. So based on, on their sales, they were able to identify that their business or part of their business was coming from the United States. So it made sense for them to, to create a, a facility a production facility in the United States. 
Uh, BMW spent three and a half years considering the labor climate, uh, port and road access, geographical requirements and constraints, airport access, and its relations with the governments in order to make this decision. Also, some of the things that are at this time, like for companies like the ones that are moving to Austin, they try to, to find an area in which they can have access to uh, human resources, educated human resources. So for Austin, that'll be us, that'll be UT Austin, and so on. So that's very important. For this, uh, they decided to put a plan in, in Spadenburg, South Carolina, which now employs approximately 4,700 workers who produce more than 500 vehicles a day. Um, and if you, if you Google this area in South Carolina, you'll see that they also have uh, multiple universities around them, like Clemson um, and North Carolina State University. So they have also part of their consideration is to have that access to, to the human resources. So location decisions. Facility location is the process of determining geographic sites for a firm's operation. Location decisions affect processes throughout the organization. Uh, marketing must assess how the location will appeal to customers, possibly opening new markets. Human resources more must attend the, to the firm's hiring and training needs. Uh, so if you're gonna bring a, a company that used to operate in Europe, now to the United States, do we have this, the people trained to do the type of work that we are gonna be doing? Uh, if not, then we have to set up a process for training the uh, potential employees. Accounting and finance must evaluate costing. So you will think about this decision, uh, putting, uh, obviously they were trying to serve this market in the East Coast of the United States. So why South Carolina, not New York or not Washington DC or Virginia? Well, there's a cost associated with, with uh, developing these these plants, and you can reach out to these areas without having to spend that much uh, money in terms of uh, the land, for example. So, accounting and finance must evaluate the costing, and operation needs to be able to meet current customer demand and provide the right amount of customer contact. So, these location decisions again affect processes throughout the organization. So what are the factors affecting location decisions? Managers must weigh many factors when assessing the desirability of particular locations. And the factor must be sensitive to location. So you will not take into account something that is not necessarily affected by the location that you are gonna place this new facility. Uh, so the factor must have a high impact on the company's ability to meet its goals. So if we look at the manufacturing, um, manufacturing companies, uh, manufacturing sector, these are the dominant factors in that um, area. First, the favorable labor climate maybe most important factor in labor intensive industries. So we wanna know, okay, so what is the cost per hour or how much are you paying your employees per hour? Um, also, is, is, is there any conflicts between current companies located in that, in that area and, and their employees? Um, typically, they would also look at um, how organized are, are these uh, markets in terms of, um, well, so there will be companies in which they will have these employees organizations. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they create a lot of trouble. So they wanna know what, are, what is the climate in that sense. Quality of life, if we are bringing all these high tech uh, companies to, to Austin, we know these people are gonna be looking for uh, good schools for the families, recreational facilities, cultural events, and attractive lifestyle. So are you able to provide that for your future employees? Uh, proximity to suppliers and resources, again, very important. So if you're receiving part of your supply by, uh, I don't know, airplanes, do you have access to 
to an airport. Or if you have to send some of your supplies to your customers, are you located close to, to them? Uh, proximity to the parent company facilities. This is important when coordination and communication is critical. So you wanna have that proximity. Uh, for example, if you want to have some type of validation process being done by the parent company, or you want them to observe the operations frequently. So that's also important. And sometimes the huh, most dominant factor will be that last one, utilities, taxes, and real estate costs. So are you getting any, any type of, of uh, tax advantage for moving into a, a specific area? Uh, what is the cost of utilities in the real estate in general? If we look at the service industry, this is things like healthcare and, and so on. Proximity to customers is very important. How conveniently customer can carry on business with a firm. So if you have a, you're setting up a hospital, you, you might want to have your hospital in a very dense uh, area, a lot of uh, population. Um, transportation costs and proximity to markets, especially for warehousing and distribution. So if you're Amazon, are you close to I-35? You move into this area, you wanna have access to, to those um, big in, interstate. Um, so, so that's why in this interstate corridor, you will have a lot of warehousing going on. Location of competitors, estimating the sales potential and impact of competition. So if, if you're competing, are you capable of competing for long-term? Um, there's a critical mass, is a situation whereby several competing firms cluster in one location attract more customers than the total number of who would shop at the same stores at scattered lo locations. So if you, for example, if you look at, um, I, don't, I don't know if you have noticed, but if you have this, uh, um, these stores that do car parts, auto parts, most of the time they're clustered together. So in that way, they, they attract more customers. They, people know where to go if they need a, a part and they will shop in those, in those areas. So that's, that's this concept. Uh, size specific factors, including residential density, traffic flow and site visibility. If you, if you have a, like the ones that are being, becoming very popular in the last few years, this uh, 24 um, hour clinics, that you will see across I-35, they, they're not hospitals, they're not uh, healthcare facilities, but they charge you very high for, for the services. So they need this high visibility, this high traffic flow in order to, to be um, efficient. Um, geographical information system decisions um, and location decisions. Um, these GIS systems are becoming very popular for this type of problem. Um, geography here, we have a, a department in geography. They do a lot of research in that area. So uh, using GIS in order to make decisions. So it is a system of computer software, hardware, and data that firms personal can use to manipulate, analyze, and present information relevant to a location decision. And it can be used to store databases, display maps, create models that can take information from existing data sets and apply analytic functions and write results uh, into new derived data sets. Together, these three functionalities of data storage, map displays and modeling are critical part of an intelligent GIS used at, to a very extent in all GIS applications. So for example, uh, I have a project with the state of Texas, um, some students working on that project in which we are trying to decide where to um, open new trauma facilities in for, for healthcare. Like not every hospital is a trauma facility. Trauma facilities typically are the ones that are in charge of creating these uh, big injuries. Like we get shot or you have a car accident or and so on. So why are these trauma facilities important is because if you don't get uh, access to these facilities in less than an hour, you might die because of the type of injury that you have. So 
So that's a problem for certain areas in Texas. And, and we are trying to be, decide, okay, if we were to expand the current network from opportunities, where should we add the next one? Um, so, so GIS has been very helpful for us to, to, to uh, study this problem because with the current tools, we can uh, study the network of traffic Let's say you, if you're in a point specific county or in a specific city and you need to get to the closest facility, we can get information about how long it's going to take you to drive to that location at five o'clock, 6 p.m., eight in the morning, and so on. And you know with traffic, those things are going to change. So, so that's the type of, of benefit that these uh, tools would, would bring um, to make those decisions. Um, so... GPS and site selection in the fast food industry. Um, until recently, fast food chains used consultants to analyze your demographic data for strategic planning and making franchise location. Now with the availability of easy to use low, low cost GIS systems that can be operated on a regular PC, small and large fast food, food chains uh, are doing these type of decisions on their own. So they, they don't have to pay these uh, consultants to make these decisions. These programs can estimate the total dollars up for graphs in a market by analyzing local age and income data from the US Census Bureau, as well as sales data from stores in the area. The programs can also tell the optimal number and locations of stores in a market and how much in sales stores can expect. Analysis can be run from any US market and can rank markets in order of viability. So for example, here we have uh, using GIS to identify uh, Starbucks locations. So um, this specific case study for uh, Hamilton, Ontario, Starbucks store addresses within, uh, Starbucks stores addresses within 20 miles of Hamilton, Ontario will obtain from the Starbucks website and import it into a map point. The store locations are denoted on maps, on the map by yellow dots. So you will see those in a minute. Um, and the demographics that come with map point were overlaid on the map. So on the first map, you will see that Oakville has more store locations than Hamilton, even though it has lower population density suggesting that store location is not given or not being driven by population density alone. So this is what we are referring to here. Uh, we have the Starbucks locations in, in yellow, right? And you see this, this area right here, uh, the, the darker the color, the more population density you will have. And you see here at the bottom, we have more people, but you only have one Starbucks location. Uh, in these areas that are less, um, let's say more, more uh, light, you, you have uh, three locations and this one that is less density populated, we have more uh, locations. So what this is showing you is like, these decisions are not only made based on, on population density. Can you think about what other, um, characteristics or demographic characteristics they're using to make these decisions. Sorry? The income, correct. So if we go back here, the second map shows the demographic by average per capita household income. Not that in this case, the store locations are based in more affluent areas. If we go here, if you add that layer of the income, you see that most of those stores are located in uh, those households that have more income. Uh, and then we have another one here. So this is the per capita household income map. So those, and those um, tools are helping these companies make those decisions. For Starbucks, it's important that people are earning more than the average salary. Uh, in order to identify the next location. That doesn't mean that you will not get some locations here, but most of them are located in that area. 
Um, now, in, in terms of on-site expansion, new location, or relocation, managers must first decide whether to expand on-site, build another facility, or relocate to another site. Um, on-site expansion has the advantage of keeping people together, reduce, reducing construction time and cost, and avoiding splitting up operations. However, as a firm expands a facility, at some point, these economies of scales are setting in. For example, we at the Ingram School of Engineering, right now we got this new building doing well, but as we move forward, um, adding mechanical engineering and maybe other programs in the future, there's a certain threshold in which we, we need to say, okay, at this point, we will have to get another facility. Um, and that's what this is trying to, to say. A new plan allows it to hire more employees, install newer, more productive machinery and better technology and reduce transportation costs. Most firms that choose to relocate are small, comprised of less than 10 employees, and more than 80% of all relocations are made within 20 miles of company's original location, which enables the firms to retain, retain their current employees. So it's not just making the decision of moving the, the, the equipment, right? It's also moving the, the people that work in the facility. So for example, here we have um, an example related to Tyler Emergency Medical Services or EMS. This is also connected to the problem that I mentioned uh, as part of my research. So the location of the two existing AMS facilities in Tyler, Texas are shown in the following map. So let me show you that. So these are the current two facilities, EMS facilities, emergency facilities. Uh, the population density for each of the city's uh, tracks is also shown. The darker, the red areas have up to 5,000 people per square mile. See these areas right here are of rapid growth and you have these areas that are pretty red. So you have only these two facilities. One is located close to this area that is uh, red, but the other ones, uh, this one in the north, doesn't have access or this facility or these people right here cannot access this one at the top. So they only have access to this one uh, in the middle. Um, so the Saudis part of Tyler census track um, 18.03 has experienced rapid growth with its population almost doubling in the last 12 years. The residents of this track have complained that it takes too long for the EMS vehicle to reach them. Again, this, um, Areas 18.03. Uh, too long, it takes too long to, to get the, to them. So, as a general guideline for locating EMS facilities in urban areas, is that EMS vehicles should be uh, able to answer 95% of its calls within 10 minutes in tracks that have a population density of 1,000 people per square mile. Uh, census Track 7 on the west side of the city with a um, uh, population density of 967 people per square mile should be also included in this uh, range. Thus, the census track that are as dark as or darker than Census Track 7 should be within a seven, uh, within a 10 minute drive zone of an EMS facility. So, what is seven? It's seven, yes, this is track seven. So anything that is darker than this color should be located within 10 minutes of a facility, or at least this uh, color or darker, we're talking about seven here. So the question is, as I mentioned for the trauma facilities, where should EMS locate three facilities so as to meet this coverage goals for Tyler? So we can also look at the, um, 
GIS data. And with map point, it is easy to calculate a dry time zone by just selecting the push pin and going under tools. Um, and then it will give you these uh, areas which shape the 10 minute uh, response zones based on the traffic. So as you can see for uh, that facility in the middle, you have that red area. That in the middle is have access to most of the uh, Tyler area, even though there's some pieces that are not covered, um, but it has a lot of, I mean, provides a lot of access. And then there are these two pieces right here that are uncovered. The EMS at the top is also provide, providing some overlapping service and it's covering these areas that are uh, at the top that are uncovered by that uh, EMS in the middle. So these right here, these areas are covered by that blue um, coverage. So as you can see now with the current, um, with the current locations, we don't provide access to this or this, or we don't, we are not able to cover those in within the 10 minute um, requirement. So if we were to design three MS locations to uh, provide these uh, required service, without overlapping, then using this GIS tool, we can identify the, the right location for that. Uh, so these three MS locations were chosen through a trial and error approach and evaluation using uh, map point. So again, the tools that we have available are allowing us to make this type of analysis rather quickly. Um, these type of problems that I'm presenting right now are in terms of just coverage, right? So can you get to this point in less than 10 minutes? Uh, that type of question. Now, from a operational facility type of uh, manufacturing production type of facility, we have other approaches that we can follow. Uh, for example, location or locating a single facility. When the facility is part of a current larger network of facilities, we assume that there is no interdependence. The process of selecting a new facility location involves a series of steps. So first, identify the important location factors and categorize them as dominant or secondary. Consider alternative regions, then narrow the choices to alternative communities and finally to specific sites. And collect data on all the alternatives Analyze the data collected beginning with the quantitative factors and bringing, bring the qualitative factors into the evaluation. The site with the highest weighted score should be the best location. So for example, we have a health watch preference matrix a new facility, Health Watch, is to be located in Erie, Pennsylvania. The following table shows the location factors, weights, and scores for one potential site. So again, this is like an evaluation score type of matrix in which you have the, the factors that are relevant, and you're giving a weight to each one of those factors. So for example, total patient miles per month, facility utilization, average time per emergency trip, expressway accessibility, land and construction costs, and employee preference. And using those weights, we can provide a score for each post potential site. And then using those scores, we can compute the weighted score. And if we get the weighted score for each potential site, then we can choose the best one. Nothing too difficult. Um, not application, management is considering three potential locations for a new cookie factory. 
They have a science course shown below to the relevant factors on a zero to 10 basis, where 10 is the best. Using the preference matrix, which location should be preferred, so preferred. So we have the location factors and we have three, three uh, potential sites. So the location factor, material supply, quality of life, milk, climate, and labor skill. And then we have the, the weight associated with these factors. As you can see, the weight should add up to, to uh, one in this case, or to 100. And, and then we have the scores for each one of them. And obviously, we're going to multiply that by the weight, and we're going to get a, a final score for each one of them. And then based on that, uh, we will select, in this case, the one with 6.8. Very simple. Uh, application number two, now we're going to start looking at distances. So we have to revisit or review the differences between uh, how distances are measured. So if we have two coordinates, we can compute this distance using rectilinear distances or a Euclidean distances. So for the Euclidean distance, you're basically looking at the Pythagoras theorem and solving uh, for, uh, for that. And if we are looking at the rectilinear distances, we are just adding the size of both uh, coordinates. Uh, so in this case, we have 80 minus 20 or 20 minus 80 and 10 minus 60. So the total would be 110. Obviously, these are not 100% accurate, right? When we look at the actual distances or practical distances, we are not looking at Euclidean or rectilinear distances. We are looking at the distance uh for the travel in in the streets right so they are not necessarily following this but these are good for computational purposes i mean makes the uh, solution or ways of finding the solution more uh easy so applying the low distance method it's a mathematical model used to evaluate locations based on proximity factors. A load may be shipments from suppliers, shipments between plants or customers, or it may be customers or employees traveling to or from the facility. So what the French looks for is to minimize its load distance score, generally by choosing a location so that large loads go short distances. To calculate this load score for any potential location, we use the actual distance between any two points using a GIS system and simply multiply the loads flowing to and from the facility by the distance drop. So LI is representing that parameter in terms of the, the load. And DI is representing the, the actual distance. So what we are looking for is that summation for every potential location. So uh, management is investigating which location will be best to position its new plan relative, relative to two suppliers. So this is application three. There are two suppliers are located in Cleveland and Toledo and three market areas represented by Cincinnati, um, Dayton, and Lima. Cincinnati, Dayton. And these are the suppliers. 
So investigating which location will be best to position this new plan relative to two suppliers and three market areas. Management has limited the search for this plan to those five locations. Uh, the following information has been collected, which is which is best assuming rectilinear distances. Okay, so we want to know if we were to choose one of these five locations and we have that information about the distances and the trips that you're gonna make per year to this location, uh, using these rectilinear distances, what will be the best location? So what we are gonna do is we're gonna apply this. We're gonna look at the summation of this load times the distance that you need to travel uh, to each one of these locations. So we start with well, Cincinnati. So if you select Cincinnati as the location, then the weighted distance times, I mean, the, the load times the distance for each one of the locations is, is here. And the score will be 8100, uh, I'm sorry, 810. For Dayton, we follow the same process, score will be 920. For Cleveland, this will be equal to 660. And for Toledo, this would be 690. And for Lima, it will be 590. So the loaded uh, score, again, is the number of trips that you're making times the distance that you have to, to travel. So you wanna minimize that. And based on these computations, the, the best location will be Lima because that's the lowest score. You'll see that this is for Cincinnati, Dayton, Cleveland, Toledo, and, and Lima. So that's why you're multiplying by zero because you're basically choosing that location. Another strategy that we can use is called the center of gravity. This is a good starting point to evaluate locations in the target area using the low distance model. So you basically are going first to determine the X and Y coordinates of different locations, either in the form of the longitude and latitude of the locations or by creating an X, Y grid. And the center of gravity x coordinate denoted by x star is found by multiplying each point's uh, x coordinate, either the longitude of the location or the x coordinate on a grid by its load, and summing these uh, products, and then dividing by the sum of the load or the sum of all the loads. And then the y coordinate denoted by y star is found the same way. So these are the two equations. You're basically looking for a coordinate X and a coordinate Y. So we're gonna be looking at the summation of those uh, y, X coordinates for each uh, location. And we're gonna multiply that by the load associated with that location. So if we had three locations, this is the summation of all three. I equals one, I equals two, and I equals three. And then we're gonna sum only the, the loads for all of these locations. And we're gonna repeat the process, but with the Y um, distances. So in this example, we're gonna find the center of gravity. So we go back to this new health watch facility is targeted to serve, uh, to serve seven census tracts in Erie, Pennsylvania. Customer would travel from seven census tract centers to the new facility when they need healthcare. 
So the question is, what is the target area center of gravity for the health wash medical facility? Uh, we will use map point in this solution and coordinates will be presented in the form of latitude and longitude rather than an X and Y grid to calculate the center of gravity. The target area is displayed on the map of area using map point. A push pin is placed in the appropriate geographical center of the sensor track. The location sensor um, is then turned on and used to obtain the coordinates. So we have all these sensor track, 15, 16, 17, 25, 26, 27, 28, and we have the population for each one of them. Total population is this much. And then we have the latitude and longitude for each one of them. So what we do, we multiply the population times the latitude and the population times the longitude. And we find the total amount for both of those columns and the total population is here. The X star is the longitude and the Y star is the latitude for the center of gravity. So we're gonna be using these equations uh, to find those values. So for the uh, multiplication of the load times the coordinate, we have this in terms of X, that is this value. And then we are dividing that by the sum of the load, which in this case is 30,190. So that coordinate is 42.1178. And then for the Y star, we're gonna use the summation of the population times the longitude. So that will be this number. And we are also gonna divide that by the sum of the load, which is 30,190. And this will be the Y star coordinate. So if we plot this into a, a map, I think I have this next. This will be the location of the, of the new facility, which is the center of gravity. And that will be the new location of the, of the facility based on that. You see that that is located in, in one of, um, in a portion of that red area where most of the density is. And, but if you look at the other pins, there seems to be close to that central location. So this is the centroid for this city or this county. This is the center for this county, center for this county, center, 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 and center. And that's uh, the center of gravity. Um, another application. A firm wishes to find a central location for its services or service. Business forecasts indicate travel from the central location to New York City on 20 occasions per year. Similarly, there will be 15 trips to Boston and 30 trips to New York Orleans. The XY coordinates are 11 and 8.5 for New York. 12 and 9.5 for Boston and 4 and 1.5 for New Orleans. The question is, what is the center of gravity of these three demand points? Okay, so if we are looking for that centralized location between these three cities, you can follow the same uh, strategy. We have to look at the, at the sum of the load. So that would be 20 plus 15 plus 30. Uh, 65, and uh, we are going to be multiplying those by the x coordinates. So x coordinate here, here, and here, and we're going to sum that, and we're going to do the same thing with the Y coordinate. I'm going to multiply those trips per the coordinate associated with that. And we're going to sum that. So that's what, what we have here. 
we have 11 times 20, 15 times 12, and 30 times 4. Those are the yellow colors multiplied by the load, and then the sum of the loads is the 65. For y, we are multiplying the 8.5, 9.5, and 1.5 times the load. We add that and we sum, and then we divide by the load. So coordinates for this case will be x equals 8, y equals 5.5. And that will be the centralized location for this, for this facility. Obviously, this is like a, a starting point because there's no guarantee that you have an area to put this facility in, in reality, right? So you might, you might say, okay, this is the right coordinate, but you might have something there already, which will not allow you to build something there. Or maybe that's a river or something else. So this starting point, and then you can search for a location in that, in that area. Um, using another strategy is using the break even analysis. This can help a manager compare location alternatives on the basis of quantitative factors that can be expressed in terms of total cost. So the first step is to determine the variable cost and fixed cost for each site. Plot the total cost lines, the sum of variable and fixed costs for all the sites on a single graph and identify the approximate ranges for which each location has the lowest cost. And then we will have to solve algebraically for the break-even points over the relevant uh, ranges. So for example, an operations manager has narrowed the search for a new facility location to four communities. The annual fixed cost, land, property, taxes, insurance, equipment, and building, and the variable costs, including the labor, material, transportation, and variable overhead are shown. So these are, uh, the total costs are for 20,000 units. So we have all this information for community A, B, C, and D. Fixed cost, variable cost, and the sum of both. So this will be, for example, for community um, A will be 150,000 plus 62 times 20,000 will give you that 1,390,000 total cost. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do, we are gonna plot the total cost curves for all the communities on a single graph identify on the graph the approximate range over which each community provides the lowest cost. So at the bottom, we have the total number of units in thousands. So this is 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, and that's how we create these lines. We plot the lines based on different number of, of quantities get to 2022. And as you can see some for community A, they start low, but as you move forward with the cap quantities, because it have um, a very high variable cost, that will increase the cost as you move forward with the number of units. So that's what you're seeing here with A. Um, it seems like C starts very high, but then as you move forward, it kind of goes down. And so, so we have this information, we have these plots, uh, and we have the areas for which A is best, um, B is best, in that uh, blue area, and then C is best in this yellow area. And those points where these areas are intersecting is what we call the break-even point. So that can help us find the, the range. So if we want to solve for that, using the break-even analysis, calculate the break-even quantities for the relevant ranges. The expected demand is 15,000 units per year. What would be the best location? 
So between A and B, we can set up that that will be this point. We can set up this equation and solve for Q. And that will tell us that at 6,250 units, we will switch from A to B. And we can do the same analysis between B and C. It tells us that between um, at 14,286 units, uh, it's better to go with C than with B. So the question is, if we expect a demand of 15,000 units, what would be the best location? The answer would be C. Because above 14,000 units, 14,286 units, the best solution will be C, or the best location will be C. And that computation basically is allowing us to identify this point and this point. Um, another application, by chance, the Atlantic City community chest has to close temporarily for general repairs. They're considering four temporary office locations. So we have the moving costs and the monthly rent for these four uh, locations. Excuse me. So use the graph to determine for what length of these each location will be favored. Okay, so in this case, the length is analogous to the volume. So if we follow the same process, right? We have the number of months here for which you are leasing and then the total cost. We can plot these, these lines. And seems like this location starts low, but they start increasing. Um, this one, same thing. And then this one start pretty high, but then uh, slow down towards the end. So the question is, use the graph to determine for what length of lease each location will be favored. Okay, so it looks like less than six months, we're gonna have this Baltic Avenue location. Right, so as, as long as we are in this line up to this point, this volatile location will be better. But then at that inflection point, here, this St. Charles place becomes a better alternative. Okay. And we identify using that uh, same analysis, looking for the intersection between those two lines, we can identify that at six months. Um, in terms of locating a facility within a network of facilities, the use of GIS tool often simplifies the search for solution when facilities are interacting. So first thing that we will do is to map the data for existing customers and facilities in the GIS. Then we're gonna visually split the entire operating area into number of parts or sub-regions that equal the number of facilities to be located. And three, we're gonna assign a facility location for each region based on the visual density of customers concentration or other factors. Alternatively, determine the center of gravity for each part or sub-region. Determine step number two as a starting location point for the facility in that sub-region. Uh, four, search for alternative sites around the center of gravity to pick a feasible location that meets the firm's managerial criteria, such as proximity to major metropolitan areas or highways. And five, compute total load distance scores and perform capacity checks before final finalizing the locations for each region. Okay, so again, this locating facility within a network of facilities. 
So for example, for this Witherspoon Automotive delivers full truck loads of parts to its customers and returns with the shipment of used automotive parts for disassembly and remanufacturing. The company presently operates out of two locations in the Southeast Spandau Road, South Carolina and Orlando, Florida. Each of these locations has a remanufacturing facility along with a detached warehouse that serves as a distribution center. The Spartan Board facility covers a total of 362 customers in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and parts of Alabama, Tennessee, and Virginia. The Orlando facility covers a total of 66 customers, mostly in Florida, and a small portion of Alabama and Georgia. Uh, the Sparta Board DC and on Orlando DC chip 70,219 and 4,629 full truckload respectively to their customers last year. So it looks like this uh, Sparta and Ford uh, facility is doing most of the work. So here we have the location um, and we also have the service area for each um, facility. So we have this uh, location and then we have this location. Uh, in purple, we have the Orlando service area and in uh, orange, we have the Spartan Perth service area. So this Witherspoon Automotive has decided to close the Spandenburg facility because of its age and obsolescence and split the Spartanburg region into two new regions, each with its own manufacturing and distribution center. Five important locations factors that will impact their final decision are quality of life. The new facility should be located in major metropolitan area. Two, distribution costs are a major determinant of profit, and so the total load distance score should be minimized. Uh, three, the economies of scale, the size of the two new facilities should not exceed a maximum of 95 truckloads of output per year. You don't want to have uh, capacity over, um, overlapping. Customer truckloads allocated between the two facilities should be fairly balanced given the previous year's demand data. And finally, marketing has indicated that they are going to develop the Northern Alabama market, thus the new distribution network should be able to accommodate up to an additional 1,000 full truckload shipments per year for the Alabama or from the Alabama market. So given all this information, we wanna find out where to locate these two new facilities. So here we have information about the location and number of full truckload shipments delivered last year in the Spartan, Spartanburg region. So the dark green represents 5,000 uh, truckload. And then the lighter becomes the less truckloads you're, you're using or delivering. So you can see here, there are several areas like this one that are pretty green, especially this uh, Atlanta area. Uh, so that looks like a very uh, high volume uh, is happening in that area. And then obviously these are two major cities. So there are the ones that are capturing. And then we have here, this other area. Um, and then Columbia, South Carolina. So we have these a number of, of areas here that are capturing the, the demand. So the next step was to partition the customers into two regions, each with a total demand of less than 9,500 top load. So as I mentioned, it seems reasonable for the management to locate one of the two new facilities near Atlanta. You see there's a lot of business happening there. Um, the center of for, for the second region is around Durham, uh, North Carolina. So if we, if we use that same 
approach that we consider the center of gravity, uh, four sites were considered based on the center of gravity and low distance measures. Uh, so those are listed here. Uh, so here we have the center of gravity and then we have possible site one, possible site four, site two, and site three. Um, all, all of them, but not all of them, but this one is close to a big city. Same thing here and here. I mean, they're, they're kind of close to Charlotte. Same thing here. So that, that requirement is um, validated. Uh, but this site right here, again, based on all the requirements, was selected based on this highway access and travel. So what this problem is trying to illustrate is that sometimes the decisions are not straightforward and you have to manage every single uh, requirement in order to come up with, with a decision. So for this particular case, it was kind of obvious to see Atlanta as a major area. So they decided to put one facility there and then to cover the second or to locate the second facility, they're looking at this area uh, close to Charlotte and they use the uh, center of gravity technique to specify more or less where that facility should be located. And then based on that, started looking at options around the center of gravity. And then the last one, I think, we have to discuss is the transportation method. If you are an industrial engineer major, you might be familiar with this. We cover this in operation research. And this is a quantitative approach that can help solve multiple facility location problems. Uh, the transportation method does not solve all facets of the multiple facility location problem. Uh, it uses linear programming. So again, operation research to minimize the cost of shipping travel from two or more plants or sources of supply, two or more warehouses or destinations. So what is the transportation model or method? You, you have, you're trying to minimize the distance travel that's the idea, that's the objective function. And you are, you are trying to make decisions in terms of where you set up your, your locations and then you're trying to decide who's gonna ship to which customer. So if you have four suppliers and five demand points, you are trying to decide if I have these four locations, this location is gonna be shipping to this destination, this location is gonna be shipping to this destination and so on. So the transportation method is allowing you to make those decisions. Once you fix a location, you have a location for the demand, for the supply, and then the transportation method is gonna tell you if you have this network, who's gonna be shipping from here to the, the, the demand points. So the first step in solving the transportation problem is to format it in a standard matrix, sometimes called a tableau. The basic step is setting up an initial tableau are as follows. We create a row for each plant, existing or new, being considered, and a column for each warehouse. We add a column for plant capacities and row for warehouse demands and insert for their specific numerical values and each cell not in the requirements row or capacity column represent a shipping route from a plant to a warehouse. Insert the unit cost in the upper right-hand corner of each of these cells. So for example, we have the Sunbell Pool Company has a plant in Phoenix and three warehouses. It is considering building a new 500 unit plant because business is booming. So one possible location is Atlanta. So initial tableau is here. As you can see, we have the suppliers on this side and we have the demand or the warehouses here. So each plant will have a capacity. So this is how much you can produce. 
And then each warehouse will have a requirement in terms of how many units they need. And then here, what we have is the cost of shipping from Phoenix to San Antonio, from Phoenix to Hot Spring, from Phoenix to Sioux Fall, from Atlanta to San Antonio, from Atlanta to Hot Spring, and to uh, from Atlanta to Sioux Falls. And that's the format of the of the initial tableau. Um, to solve this problem, you have to have some type of uh, linear programming model in place. Again, the transportation model is, is very straightforward. You have, you're minimizing the multiplication of the cost times the distance. Um, and if you're using a particular arc in the network, then the cost will be applied. If you are not using that arc, the cost is gonna be zero. And then you have a group of constraints that are associated with the capacity of your uh, plants in a group of constraints that are associated with the demand. So solving this problem is not part of the of this course. Again, this is discussed in operational research for the IE mayors. But if you solve this problem, this is the optimal uh, tableau. This is basically that saying that Phoenix is going to supply 200 units to San Antonio and 200 units to uh, Sioux Falls. And Atlanta is gonna supply 400 units to Hot Springs and 100 units to Sioux Falls. Um, so that will be the 900. And the demand, 200, it will be satisfied, the 400 will be satisfied, and the 300 will be satisfied. Um, so if you, if you were to decide where to place that, um, this new location uh, as part of your network, then this is telling you, yes, if you set up that location, then that Atlanta will help you uh, serve hot spring and also Sioux Falls. And those are the areas that you're gonna be serving because it's less, than, less expensive based on, on the numbers. Uh, and that's the benefit of transportation problem or method. Okay, so this is uh, the, the representation. So this is the Atlanta factory now is gonna be serving this area and part of this area. And then the Phoenix location will be serving part of this area and this area. If you think about future expansion, then this, this plant can help you expand in this direction. Um, so not only in this direction, but also in this direction. Um, which is good. Same thing here, you have an opportunity to explore the market in that direction as well. Uh, so here we have a, another application. This is again related to the transportation problem. Um, so this is a, a, a company that makes picante sauce hot sauce in San Antonio and New York City. Distribution centers are located in Atlanta, Omaha, and Seattle. The capacity demands and shipment costs per case are shown below. Uh, so we have the costs associated with the distribution from San Antonio and New York to Atlanta, Omaha, and Seattle. And we also have the capacities of San Antonio and New York. And we have the demand for Atlanta, Omaha, and Seattle. So it's a type of the same type of information. Uh, again, capacity limitations, demand for each uh, customer or distribution center in this case, and the cost associated with shipping between these these locations. So we set up the initial tableau. Same idea. We have the demand. We have the capacity and we have the cost.
And again, in order to solve this problem, you have to rely on, on, on these linear programming skills. Uh, but if, if we solve, I don't have the solution for this problem, but this is the initial tableau. So you will find a, a similar solution that is going to tell you how much San Antonio is going to ship to Atlanta, Omaha, and Seattle. And New York is going to ship to Atlanta, Omaha, and Seattle. Other methods of location analysis, heuristics. These are algorithms that can be useful, solution guidelines or rules of thumb that find feasible but not necessarily best solutions to problems. Simulation, uh, a modeling technique that reproduces the behavior of a system. And optimization, uh, you, you take courses in simulation and optimization as part of IE. Procedure used to determine the best solution, generally utilize simplified or and less realistic views of a problem. So the rest of this presentation is just giving you some solved problems. You can look at those on your own for your benefit. Um, so I'm not gonna go through them, but those are there for you to, to look at them in um, by yourself. Uh, and then you can let me know if you have any questions. But that's the last slide. And I'm gonna stop here and we'll talk more uh, next week.